Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar today, which is a webinar series designed for CMI and by CMI. I'm Cynthia Howell, and I'm your I'm the Education Workforce Development Manager for the Critical Materials Institute. And I'm going to be your moderator for today. I want to tell you a little bit about uh, the webinar. These uh, webinars are hosted by Colorado School of Mines. Um, we are always looking for suggestions of future webinars. And of course, again, with these webinars being designed for you, our CMI family, uh, we want to bring you what is of interest to you. So please don't hesitate to keep us engaged with your ideas on what else you'd like to see in webinars. If you have a suggestion, if you'd send that via email, cmi at minds.edu. This is a public webinar and a recording is gonna be available next week at aimslab.gov slash CMI. And you need to look under the um, webinar menu and you can also find this on YouTube on the Critical Materials Institute channel. Our presenters today would like for you to hold questions to the end of the presentation. However, the question and answer cue box is open and as soon as you have that question, if you would put it in, that would ease the transition from the end of the presentation to question and answer, because there will already be questions for our group to answer. So please don't hesitate and make sure that you get your questions in there immediately. I am going to turn this over to Dr. Art DeGroat, De excuse me, almost said that wrong, DeGroat, and uh, he has masterfully woven in uh, information about his team that he's going to be introducing today. So I'm going to turn it over to, again, Dr. Art DeGroat and with Great Plains Partners Venture Group. Well, thank you very much, Cynthia, and uh, thank you to all of our CMI community. Um, I will talk a little bit about today about who a Great Plains Partners Ventures Group are, uh, our relationship as an affiliate member of CMI, and talk a little bit about uh, what we do to help commercialize some of the amazing discoveries that are coming out of our federal laboratories and, and our universities. Um, how about the next slide, please? So Great Plains Partners uh, is a group uh, that formed uh, several years ago. Um, we are a Kansas-based uh, LLC company. Um, we also operate in a federal new opportunity zone, um, which is a, a enormous uh, uh, incentive for uh, investment um, where there's great tax uh, advantages to major investors uh, to help us bring in the capital needed to uh, commercialize some of your work. Um, we're also a veteran owned business. Um, not all of us are veterans. Um, and we have an affiliate partnership with a DC, Washington DC based technology defense uh, firm called Great Plains Innovations. And we have a lot of uh, connections inside of the defense supply chain. Um, there's four people here you can see uh, collectively, and I'll show you the next slide, we'll have uh, the, other, the other two gentlemen. Uh, collectively, we have 92 years of relevant experience in technology commercialization. Um, it's a diverse team. Uh, it's centered around our, our, our senior managing director, uh, Mr. Robert Happity. Uh, Bob had a 45 plus year career uh, in, in business development, technology development, starting in Wall Street, uh, major work international in the auto industry with Russia. Um, and then uh, finished his career, um, that part of his career in the, with the New York University system where he commercialized uh, many, many innovations uh, coming out of the uh, New York State University system. And I'll share one of those with you today. Next slide. These are our two other associate members from our Albuquerque, New Mexico office. Um, collectively, as I mentioned, we have a lot of experience. Uh, our backgrounds, when you take a chance, and these slides will be made available to you if you're interested, but our educational backgrounds and our experiential backgrounds uh, go from finance, business development, engineering, IT, energy, and national security. So, so we have quite a diverse bit of individual capability that we all bring together um, to, to help our clients. Uh, at the end of this, my presentation, I'll be followed by Mark, you see here on the slide, and Mark will talk a little more in depth about our, 
how we operate. Next slide, please. We really have two focus areas. This, this chart that you see before you um, presents our technology focus areas that as, of, as of currently. We're currently working in critical materials and clean energy transition technologies. We also have an industry focus. Um, because of our expertise and because of the demands and the connections that we have, we really focus on, on, on national energy needs, national security needs, and national technology needs. And as you can see here, a lot of these industry focuses kind of cross because uh, our work in critical materials, while it's, it's helpful to the uh, energy needs of our, our country for clean energy, it's also a, a major uh, need for some of our defense uh, technologies. So, so a lot of these industries cross, but the technologies have dual use. So, so that's, that's a win-win and we enjoy working with, with tech, emerging technologies to commercialize them where, where there's multiple clients and, and, and demands being met. Next slide, please. This is a somewhat complicated chart, but it really tells, it, 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 could, be, it could be told as a history lesson of how commercialization has happened in the past and, and how it is today. So I'm gonna take this slide and, and kind of and focus your attention in certain segments of the chart and, and kind of walk you through a little bit about this. But this, is, this, this tells you why Great Plains Partners came to be and, and how we operate. Um, most most uh, technology and commercialization development typically has started historically from the left to the right on the top. A discovery was made at a federal lab or a university and, and, and it's patented and, it's, and there's a tech transfer opportunity. Um, and, and, and then someone's trying to push that technology out into the field. Uh, so they're pushing it from left to right. Um, our, our process is the opposite. We start with the demand. So we start with government, society, corporations, industry that have a problem statement. Uh, there is a real challenge here and we need technologies to help us solve this problem. So we start from the right of the chart in the demand side of the problem. And then we reach back to the left towards the lucrative technologies and patents, intellectual property solutions and, tr and bring them to, to the client to the right. The problem of regardless which way you go, trying to push your technologies into the commercialization or trying to pull your technologies exactly to where they are needed, whichever way you go, you end up in the area called the valley of death. Currently, a lot of corporations uh, are no longer doing their own research and development. So the question becomes, who is doing the applied research to get the, the, the basic research and the basic patents to the proper level of technology readiness and manufacturing readiness uh, that is ready for a corporation or a government agency to acquire it for it for implementation and commercialization. So the Valley of Death is this is this area where there's not a lot of funding, uh, there's not a lot of leadership, and and there's not a lot of responsibility. And, and so venture groups, uh, um, all kinds of investments uh, are made to try to th capitalize and pr provide the resources. And it's not just money, uh, it's, it's also the talent and the expertise that can take a basic research, get it through the applied stages and get it ready for product development where it can be commercialized at, at a larger scale to meet the national demands or the industry demands. So that's what we do. You see the scale in the middle and that's uh, commonly used uh, technology readiness levels. It's a scale from one to nine, as you can read there and, and generally describes what happens at each level. Um, there's also a corresponding scale on one to nine that is called MRL, manufacturing readiness level. Sometimes the technology is much more ready than it is to manufacture at scale. So we look at both of those and that's why there's a lot of engineering and business development that goes along with just the technology development. Um, so we work with TRLs and MRLs and we typically find from the demand, we will find the most promising technologies at the, at the TRL MRL level of three. And then we help uh, bring in resources of talent, expertise, engineering, manufacturing, um, and to bring it up to level six. And at that point, uh, we're ready to introduce that to a, to a major client. 
So that's a little bit how we operate. Um, and that's a little bit of a landscape of commercialization, uh, over, overly simplified, but it, it's, it's, it's a very, very accurate portrayal of, of, this, uh, of this enterprise. Next slide. This chart just shows a simple standard operating procedure or a pathway. Um, once we identify specific needs from problem statements, um, then we, as we said, we, we do some technology scouting and we identify the appropriate technologies. We do our due diligence. And in this case, it's both directions. We're doing due diligence to see if this technology, where is this technology on the TRL and MRL scales? Uh, where does it fit compared to other te technologies in its field that are, that, that are relative to that? Uh, and we're also doing due diligence on the customer. We're, we're, we're constantly working with the customer, the problem statement saying, will this be a feasible technology, uh, a, a feasible, acceptable technology to answer this question? So, so our due diligence goes both directions as a demand pull enterprise. We then generally enter at a 12 month options agreement. Um, we do market research continuously. Um, we evaluate and help assist with getting public funding and sometimes private funding as well, if that's needed, uh, to advance this through the valley of death. And then we exercise a lot of intellectual property agreements, uh, mature the technology, and then we have several exit strategies uh, depending on where what is the best way to get this uh, technology into, into the industry and into, into the field. And that may be startup companies. It may be merging with, with um, existing companies that are adding uh, this technology to their, to their current business plans. There's several exit opportunities uh, that we help broker and, and make happen to get that out into the field. Next slide. This is an example that I offered uh, to share with you. And this was from uh, Mr. Mr. Robert Happany, who was our, our senior uh, um, manager and founder. Um, when, when Bob was uh, working uh, in, in the uh, New York State system, um, he had uh, got a problem statement from Ford Motor Company that said because of fuel efficiency and, and economic and environmental issues, there was, a, there was a problem and a demand to reduce the overall weight bumper to bumper on Ford, Ford cars and trucks. Doing due diligence, Bob and others and his team discovered that one of the areas where, of opportunity was in the heavy, the heavy parts were brakes, heavy steel components of, of brakes. And, and so with that, he uh, went, went into Sandia National Laboratories and found relevant technologies on, on using uh, magnesium and alloy materials, a lot of it coming from, from overseas. Um, he also saw that Stony Brook University was doing some applied research with that. So, so um, Bob Happity uh, created Advanced Materials LLC, um, a, a intellectual property holding company, and, and then raised the funds to develop that, uh, which, which became um, magnesium alloy uh, brake rotors uh, that, that were sold, licensed to Bendix, and they were, within two years, they were put on every Ford uh, car coming out, out of the assembly line uh, internationally. Um, so this example kind of shows how, how this works from, from the right to left, where Ford Motor Company had a problem, Bendix was the supplier, basic research out of Sandia, applied, some applied research at Stony Brook, but there's a valley of death, and, and this organization created a LLC, transferred all the technology to it, uh, paid royalties back to, to Sandia and Stony Brook and, 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 the, and the PIs that, that invented all these things, licensed it, and then sold the company later on to United Technologies, who also used those materials and those technologies for other applications like refrigeration units on commercial trucks that carry frozen goods and many others. So this example is what informs us every day on the possibility and, and, and a, a proprietary and unique method of, 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 of pulling needed technologies into the field uh, in the most expeditious way, recognizing there's a valley of death that has to be navigated. So with that, I'll take the next slide. The, this is my last slide I'll present before my colleague Mark will, will share uh, a little bit deeper uh, about what we do. These are some of our, our broad services or functions. And, and as I mentioned, uh, we do the market research and customer discovery. For uh, Here's an example. Yesterday, uh, I had the opportunity to go to CMI and, one, and, and another and a CMI corporate uh, partner 
and had an opportunity to bring uh, one of the nation's 10 top, 10 largest IT uh, asset disposition companies to look at how they're recovering rare earth elements through a, 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 a process uh, of chemical leaching. And, uh, and I got to bring a customer to meet with the principal investigator, meet with the CMI community uh, at Ames, and to meet one of the commercial companies that is currently involved and has the license to help commercialize this. So uh, this, these slides and this, these charts show the, the process and the, and the specific things that we have to do um, to, bring, to bring this all together to commercialize some of the best uh, technologies and solutions that are being invented out of our laboratories and with our partners. At this point, I'll turn the presentation over to my colleague, Mark, and he'll share a few more slides about how we, do, a little more in depth about the commercialization process. Mark. Thank you, Dr. DeGroote. So uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Mark Niederhaus, and just as Dr. DeGroote uh, noted, I'll be discussing the commercialization process or uh, some tools that you all might be able to apply in uh, your professional work. So what we found and what many of you may have experienced uh, at this point is that a great idea or innovation doesn't necessarily translate into a successful business. Uh, even more so, sometimes uh, you might find yourself in the lag lab and have a eureka moment. However, uh, there might be a gap between that eureka moment and how specifically to commercialize uh, that idea or technology into a full-fledged business. Uh, therefore, we'd like to present a systematic approach one can take to explore how to take that idea uh, or the technology through that path to commercialization. And this includes uh, drafting a value proposition, conducting customer discovery market research, and the feed lap, feedback loop between both, uh, completing or conducting a, a business model canvas, and of course, commercialization. So why learn about these elements of value proposition development, customer discovery, and market research? So value proposition allows one to communicate to one's prospective customer what value you're bringing to them, how you're solving a pain point or a need or a want for them with a unique solution. And this solution uh, is going to be differentiated compared to your competitors. Uh, customer discovery, allows you to understand truly what are those pain points for the customer? Um, what are their needs? What are their wants? And how are they currently solving whatever their pain points are? And then finally, as we know that no company operates in a vacuum, market research is conducted, or its value is to understand the exogenous variables that may be at play uh, by way of industry, competitors, market trends, and others, on how to uh, create your business and operate within that field. And this is important to identify opportunities and minimize risk. Now, uh, what happens again if you don't necessarily, or why would you wanna learn these? Well, we can look at the inverse on uh, Sony, Sony Betamax and what happened with them after not conducting proper customer discovery or market research and not conveying a proper value proposition. So uh, in the late 70s and early 1980s, uh, there was an introduction of home uh, entertainment, home video entertainment. And uh, the first to market was Sony Betamax. They had a superior video quality when compared to the second to the market, which was JVC's VHS tapes. So one would figure, that means Sony probably won the game. And unfortunately for Sony, that was not the case. Uh, the fact of the matter was they did not conduct proper customer discovery. They understood and they conveyed a value proposition that the customer wanted a superior video quality, as well as having that first to market, having the accessibility of having it now, compared to uh, JVC understanding that the customer didn't necessarily want the superior quality, superior video quality of, uh, of their tapes. They wanted something that was inexpensive and easily accessible to their house. Uh, secondarily, JVC understood that the customer did not want to trade out two tapes per movie to watch one movie uh, where Sony Betamax needed that. 
And secondarily with it, Sony did not understand what market they were operating in while JVC did. JVC understood that there was a growing trend throughout communities, throughout the United States, of video, video rental services, the mom and pop shops uh, pre-blockbuster to rent your videos. And so what they did was they emphasized that relationship with those video rental stores. Uh, and so fast forward to the early 1980s, if it, you were wanting to bring home Jaws or Star Wars or Raiders of the Lost Ark to your home, odds are when you were going to go to your mom and pop shop, it was going to be on VHS, which guaranteed you needed a VH, VHS tape player at home, and therefore they won. And then finally, uh, bringing back, why learn about all these elements? The fact of the matter is 90% of businesses in the United States fail, and many times, that's just as a Sony Betamax, it's because they didn't do proper due diligence within those elements. And you want to increase your probability of success, and this is how to do so. So what is a value proposition? A value proposition is just a clear, concise method of conveying how you're solving a problem for your customer, as well as conveying your uniqueness, your differentiation to them. And uh, what I mean by differentiation is it can exist on multiple levels. We have price differentiation. Think of Target versus Walmart. Walmart is uh, inexpensive when compared to Target. Both do the same thing. You can shop for clothing, shop for, shop for groceries and whatnot. Quality, you can differentiate by way of quality. And in this case, it could be Whole Foods. Whole Foods offers a myriad of organic vegetables and produce choices. It could also be differentiation by way of status. Uh, think of a Rolex. Uh, Rolex conveys a certain status symbol. And then finally, you can differentiate by way of performance. Think of the minivan versus a Ferrari. The Ferrari is much quicker uh, for that consumer. Now, how to create this value proposition? Uh, first off, you need to identify the customer's problem. Then you determine the product's unique benefits and then craft the value proposition. And the first time that you craft a value proposition, it's going to be a hypothesis, which later on we're going to see through the feedback loop of customer discovery, whether it proves or disproves it. So you identify the customer's problem, what specifically is bothering them, what is the pain point. Uh, you determine your specific unique benefits, how you're solving that problem. And then again, you craft that value proposition in a clear, concise manner. And it's very important to use the customer's own language in this process. Here's a value proposition example. Uh, we have Grammarly, which helps uh, with grammar of uh, written text. Uh, and their value proposition is to compose bold, clear, mistake-free writing with Grammarly's AI-powered writing assistance. So as you see here, uh, what they're trying to solve is errors in writing. And they're solving it uh, by way of using an AI-powered writing assistant. Now, what is customer discovery and market research? So customer discovery is basically narrowing down who specifically your customer, learning their life story. Uh, how is their day-to-day? -day? How do they currently address their pain points? What are their needs and their preferences? It involves talking to customers, observing their behavior, and then gathering that data to look at trends. Market research, uh, as I discussed earlier, is just exogenous uh, research looking at industry competitors and overall market trends. And both of them provide valuable insights that will help guide your business implementation. Now, how to conduct that customer discovery. Uh, first off, you wanna identify your target audience. Uh, you want to uh, observe them in their day-to-day. -day, and then you wanna conduct interviews. This can be through surveys, through telephone calls, through emails. But what you want to do, the goal is to ask open-ended questions. You don't want yes or no's. You want to know how specifically their life is, how specifically they're solving their problems. Uh, and through open-ended questions, you might gain insights. So some open-ended questions you might want to, to look at if you're a rare earth element refiner is how do you currently solve your problem of gathering your feedstock? Uh, what processes do you use for that? What are the main pain points that you have in those processes? What improvements can be made upon those processes? And then you want to introduce your technology and you want to discuss with them how they feel about that, conceptualize them, help them imagine 
um, your specific solution and how they would interact with it. And the important goal here is to not try to sell your technology, but rather try to understand how they would understand your technology. And then uh, finally, you want to observe their behavior and then analyze that data to understand those trends. And then the feedback loop, you go back to your value proposition and determine, is this value proposition accurate? Do I need to change it? Do I need to change my business model? Now on the topic of business models, uh, we have uh, a tool called the Business Model Canvas. And what this does is allows you uh, to have all the aspects of the business model uh, up for you to modify and visualize at any given point. And um, so this is a visual chart. It's not concrete, meaning that it's as flexible over time. As you learn more about your prospective customer, you might need to change some areas from within it. And so uh, to discuss the areas, we have uh, the customers themselves. Who are you selling uh, the product to? Uh, whose pain points are you solving? The value proposition, what value are you bringing to them? Uh, the revenue, how are you going to make money? The channels, how are you going to provide the product or service? The key activities is what is required to make that product or service available to the customer? The key partners, who are the key uh, partners or suppliers you need and what does the relationship look like? Do you have strategic alliances? Do you have joint ventures? Are they simply market partners? Uh, the key resources, what are the most important resources needed to make your business function? Your costs, so what costs or expenditures are needed to carry out the business model? And then finally, the customer relationships. How does your company get, keep, and grow their customer base? Now, here's an example um, that uh, we all probably know and love, and that's Netflix. Uh, if we rewind back to you know, 2010, 2008, uh, this is still the era of Blockbuster. Uh, most individuals at this point are going to rent out tapes every Friday night or what have you uh, to watch. This was um, a time where Netflix entered the market. They completely disrupted by way of offering an incredible innovation that revolutionized the whole industry. Now everything was on demand. Media was on demand. No need to go and uh, visit somewhere to get media. You could have whatever you wanted to watch at any given point. Now, looking at the customer segments, they break down by way of demographic from families, from individuals, from ages, from geographic trends, regions, and what have you. Their value proposition, of course, is uh, that expansive content library. You can watch sports, you can watch documentaries, you can watch uh, the Real Housewives of wherever the Real Housewives are at. Uh, there is exclusive content. There's specific shows that are exclusive to them. Uh, the convenience and mobility of watching whenever you wanna watch, you need to use the bathroom, no problem, easily pause, come back afterwards. The personalization aspect of giving you recommendations that are personalized to you. No longer are you gonna visit Bill at the local blockbuster who may or may not know you, may or may not know rom-coms when you really want a recommendation on rom-coms. The personalization here, their value proposition is catered to you, the recommendations. Of course, there was unlimited access and there's no, um, there's localization. Now, how are they making money? Of course, we know it's all subscription-based. Their key activities is content creation. Here in New Mexico, where I'm based, uh, they have huge studios. Uh, they have content licensing and acquisition. Uh, they're partnering with uh, other distribution houses and production houses. And of course, they have their marketing pushes, their advertising, and their influencing, so by way of social media. Their key partners are those content owners, again, those production houses, uh, the IP holders, uh, so the intellectual property of who owns films, uh, the content delivery partners, so uh, they may partner with certain internet service providers, uh, and their key resources are their brand, their content library, their selection of, of movies and films and TV shows, uh, their, of course, their app and website, which many people love. I think the user experience is fantastic. And of course, the algorithms and data, the recommendation aspect that they can give you. Their cost structure, they do have costs of revenue. They do have to spend money to develop uh, new shows. Uh, they do have marketing pushes. They do have to advertise. Uh, they do have uh, technology development 
to do research and development towards their app base and the general administrative uh, costs of uh, paying for their workforce. And then uh, the customer relationships they have are uh, self-service, of course. Anybody can go to the app and take a look at it. And we have uh, the channels by way of social media, uh, consumer electronic devices, et cetera. Now let's look at a more CMI specific example here. And this is a Critical Materials LLC. Uh, and this is a business that uh, looked at optioning a technology that extracts rare earth elements from coal fly ash as a feedstock in an environmentally benign manner, so a green manner, using supercritical CO2. So the customer segments uh, we identified here are the United States government and the national defense and tech industries. And uh, what do we offer? Uh, as we know, the supply uh, is at risk right now. So we offer national security, a consistent domestic supply of rare earth elements and critical materials. Then there's also the customer segments of coal power plant operators, coal mining companies. And uh, what we offer to them is uh, an added revenue source. Uh, we also offer uh, the ability to clean coal fly ash. Uh, you may or may not have seen in the news, uh, there's certain coal power plant operators with dirty coal fly ash impoundments such as Duke Energy, uh, and they've been fined substantially and they need a way to clean their coal fly ash. So we're offering them that. And then from the road construction, the cement industry that uses coal fly ash as a pozzolan or an input, as well as the fertilizer industry, uh, there's a value proposition of cleaning that coal fly ash and giving an extra feedstock uh, for them to use within their services. So uh, the revenue streams, there's dynamic pricing, uh, the rare earth elements uh, pricing, of course, has been volatile, but there is that dynamic pricing of selling those rare earth elements. There's the reselling of the beneficial use coal fly ash, and of course, the cleaning up revenue. Now, the key partners that we have uh, are the coal power plant operators, uh, as discussed, the coal fly ash contractors uh, as a supply of the feedstock, the coal mining companies, uh, which again is another supply source, and then the rail and freight companies to transport the feedstocks to and fro. The cost structure, uh, uh, the money is spent on uh, building out that extraction facility, the leasing costs, the purchasing of the feedstock of coal fly ash, uh, the transportation costs of the coal fly ash, and then the licensing costs. The key resources we have here are the intellectual property, the patent, uh, as well as the experienced coal fly ash industry personnel to help guide the, the operations, the extraction facility itself to extract out the rare earth elements, um, and of course the supplies of the coal fly ash. Now, uh, the customer relationship is a dedicated assistance and the channels we'll be looking at is the American Coal Fly Ash Association conferences, that they're the largest coal fly ash association in the United States on uh, discussing and selling with them, the coal mining industry conferences, et cetera. So to sum up the commercialization process, customer discovery, market research, value proposition, they're paramount to creating or uh, increasing your probability of success for a business. Uh, one must understand your customer needs uh, by way of uh, customer discovery to be able to convey that value proposition. And it's important to do that in the customer's own language. So that way you can stand out from your competitors. And the business model canvas is a fantastic way of being able to sort out and develop out all the elements from your business model. Now, finally, we'd like to touch on shortly public funding opportunities. So we have the business model of uh, the business created. Now, how to fund it? Uh, so fortunately, there are uh, a myriad of public uh, funding opportunities uh, through the Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Uh, case in point, the Department of Energy has $62 billion for technology development. There's also other federal funding sources, uh, including the Small Business Innovation Research and Small Business Technology Transfer Program, the Department of Defense, the National Science Foundation, and the Technology Commercialization Fund. And um, you know, one might feel a little overwhelmed uh, with the intricacies of the application process for a lot of these funding opportunities. And fortunately, uh, throughout state to state, there is uh, funding assistance. There's many centers uh, within New Mexico. We have 
a center called the Arrowhead Center. Uh, but it, I'm sure in a state near you, they have a similar uh, assistance uh, offerings to be able to help you, guide you through the process of uh, pursuing that funding. And then uh, from the state funding opportunities, uh, depending upon state per state, there is many state funding opportunities. Uh, a lot of states are looking to increase employment and therefore uh, they're willing to invest in uh, technologies and opportunities that can help do that. In our case here in the state of New Mexico, uh, we have something called the Technology Readiness and Gross Receipts Initiative, which Critical Materials was an awardee of. So uh, at this time, uh, we would like to thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak to you all. And uh, we would love to field any comments or questions we have. And during this process, um, Darish Todiger uh, from Great Plains Partners will also be joining Dr. DeGro and myself. I'd like to take a moment on behalf of the Critical Materials Institute to thank you for a great presentation. So um, between uh, uh, Art and Mark, uh, really giving uh, a value proposition for their work. And I think it's really interesting to see um, all of the different areas, focus areas of uh, tech technology, uh, critical materials, clean energy, um, an energy transition. And that is certainly where CMI sits in terms of critical materials as well. Um, anything that is developed in our research area, we try to get out immediately into industry. So um, a really, really great fit as an affiliate. Um, I am, I think I'm seeing one right now, one question queued in the Q&A. If you want to take that, Mark. Uh, thank you, Cynthia. Uh so we have a more of a comment from uh, Dennis uh, Proteus. He's saying, "Great presentation. Thank you so much for uh, for the opportunity." And uh, we have a couple uh, questions coming in. Uh, the next one is, uh, "Can I share this with non CMI members?" Uh, I believe this is going to be made public, uh, so uh, you're more than welcome to share with uh, non CMI members. Uh, okay. Uh, and then uh, next question is from uh, Huang Yue Jin. Uh, based on your experience, how much percentage of new technologies in technology readiness level four advanced to technology readiness level nine? Uh, I don't know if- uh, Mark, I could, yes, yeah, so I'll handle that. Um, I don't have the specific percentage uh, as asked, but I would say today, uh, none of it, very little of it advances from four to, to nine without a, a, a mediator. Um, some 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 source like a venture group or some other agency commercialization partner that is helping to bring it. It, it, it on its own devices. It doesn't necessarily move much past four or five, um, but com coming out of basic research at a universities or out of federal laboratories. There needs to be a, a new a, a intermediate partner to bring to bring it forward. Okay, thank you, Dr. DeGroat. And uh, the next question we have. Uh, is uh, do you identify clients first or do you identify technologies first? As a demand pull uh, venture group, we start with a problem state. We start with the customer uh, because it's, 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 it's fruitless to push a technology through when no one to commercialize it if no one is, is, going to, is going to manufacture it or implement the solutions and use it. So we do start with the, the, with the client uh, which is where, where the commercialization need comes from. And, and, we, and we, we bring them to um, the principal investigator and, and, and where it is at, at tier at one through four or three. And, and we, we start that relationship and we move it forward together is, is how that works. Thank you, Dr. Gugro. Uh, and uh, the next question we have is, how do you decide which technologies to help advance? Generally, um, generally that is done in, we do our due diligence to find out a, a, a lot of these solutions are maybe not ready for manufacturing or scaling. So, uh, so we make a technical and, and a market uh, judgment and we bring in consultants that are experts and, and with the folks that, that are currently in possession of these discoveries and, and, and we decide where is it at and, and what does it take to get it commercialized? So, so yesterday, as the example I gave about uh, bring, bringing an IT, a, a IT asset 
disposition uh, market leader to look at rare earth uh, extractions from e-waste, um, th they're looking at things. So, so one of the questions that came up yesterday is, well, what about licensing and permitting? Uh, what about environmental uh, issues? Uh, is there certificates for, for, for re recycling uh, that, that can be made from the government? Are there limitations for OSHA? So, so a lot of these things are all negotiated with the principal investigator and the initial commercial partner uh, to find out if some of these issues can be overcome or what are those issues. Some of these little things, it's not the technology is not ready to scale. Sometimes there's policies, regulations, and things that, that prevent it from scaling. And that's why us as an intermediary at Great Plains Partners Ventures Group, we work through all those issues and bring in the expertise to say, yes, we can get ISO uh, certification for this. We can get re uh, recycling uh, um, credentials uh, on all of this work. Yes, we can uh, meet all OSHA standards. This solution is feasible and acceptable because it does not violate any OSHA requirements by state where we may be doing this manufacturing or, or, or applying the solution. So all of that work, uh, there's a lot of pieces to go on it but outside of the actual readiness of the technology itself. Thank you, Dr. DeGroat. Now I'll handle uh, the next one. Uh, the question is, what prices do you need on the rare earth elements to make coal ash extraction model commercially viable? And so the question, uh, the answer to that is um, we are in development uh, of that at the moment, but that's also the importance of uh, discussing and looking at customer discovery and the value proposition development, and as well as from the business model canvas, looking at uh, multiple revenue streams. So uh, yes, there, there is the question on what is the price specifically for the rare earth elements, but that's only one small part of the revenue stream of this specific technology by way of cleaning coal fly ash, bringing additional coal fly ash inputs or supplies to the market. So um, it's more so a question on how best to look at the value proposition of each segment and being able to uh, find a mutual benefit by way of selling them something of value and gaining that revenue. Um, for, for that specific technology, rather than just focusing on the rare earth element pricing. Uh, the Mark, next- Mark Lee, can I, may I double tap on that? Um, of course. Again, but I, or, so one of the things we recognize that rare earth element as a commodity pricing is, is indexed internationally by, uh, by the major player. Uh, and and, and, and uh, there's a lot of fluctuation in the prices of RE commodities. Uh, and, it, and it's done intentionally to, to uh, disincentivized commercialization, domestic commercialization of RE uh, extraction and recovery uh, to, to, to maintain a reliance on, on foreign sources. So one of the things we're working now with through Great Plains Partners is we're working with some, some potential clients that have requirements like the defense industry. There, there's certain policies where they're not allowed to have a weapon system that is reliant on a, on a, a foreign or internationally uh, member of the supply chain for, for, for specific critical pieces that sustain that system. So in this case, um, where the defense contractors are making several weapon systems and, and systems for our, our nation's security, um, they, are, they, they are required to get domestic REE, and therefore the price fluctuation is not a barrier if we have a client lined up, and then we can go ahead and commercialize it because we have a paying client regardless of what, of what the uh, international market on REE costs are. So we're looking at that end of it. Again, that demand pull, the demand is that they have domestic source REE on certain platforms. And that, that's not everything. That's, that's not um, electric vehicles. That's not wind turbine engines, but that is for, for military equipment. So there's an example where, where by customer development up front, then that, that negates the, the, the turmoil right now of fluctuating REE prices as a disincentive to commercialize some of the great technologies that extract it. Thank you, Dr. DeGroat. And uh, the last question, uh, it seems here, oh, we got another one. Uh, what is the range of venture funding that Great Plains Partners provides? There's a lot of those. One of the things we discovered um, most of our work is, is bringing new technologies and solutions to already existing industry leaders, um, as opposed to creating a startup company. We're, we're totally capable of creating a startup company where we can develop those things and bring it into, into the market. 
But a lot of our clients are already in the in, they're industry leaders in their field, and, and they just have problems that they themselves can't get through, and they and they can't cast a line across the valley of death and find and find and find where the where the right solutions are. So, um, so that's where we come in, uh, and and working both sides and bringing towards the middle. It, it almost connects to the next question here about what advice to give technology material two two to three to prepare for working with you. Uh, the first thing I think is 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 to be to be willing to work with 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 people like us. Um, to be willing to share, uh, make time of your busy schedules. And I know I know active scientists working in laboratories, students supervising postdocs and other things. There's a lot of things going on, but I, I noticed where we have met, had great success working with people at, through through the CMI community, where they have great things at at lower TRLs was they made a lot of time. Uh, they shared scientific papers with us. They, they, they helped us understand what they're doing. They, they, they connected us to some industry partners. Uh, they helped let us uh, see and help with some of their existing federal financing and, 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 uh, and where their grants and funds are coming from. So it's, it's like any other thing else. It's, it's, it's a trust relationship that has to be built. It's sharing, it's making time for each other. Um, and, and, and I've been to Ames five times now in the last 90 days uh, because of the openness to meet with industry partners and scientists and labs. And um, so, so I think that's the, that's the key is being willing and investing in, in, in your own success by, by, by having relationships with people that can help you advance your, your, your discoveries, uh, ultimately into commercialization. Okay. Thank you, Dr. DeGroat. And uh, final question here we have is, how are you able to differentiate between the low value rare earth elements and the in demand higher value rare earth elements? And uh, I'm more than happy uh, to address that. So uh, we do ongoing testing from supply sources. Uh, so uh, both domestically and globally, uh, rare earth elements uh, within our feedstock of coal fly ash is found in different concentrations in different areas. And so we test that uh, concentration out to determine uh, what specific feedstock would be optimal to be able to address the demand that Dr. DeGroat uh, noted uh, for the rare earth elements. Uh, Dr. DeGroat, did you have anything else to add on that? Yeah, um, I'm not sure what he means by low, the, low, the, the, the value of the REs. Is that the, do, the dollar value or, uh, or, is, or is that the need value um, by, by industry? But um, we do differentiate by we know the we know the yields of things. For example, uh, from from e, from so take 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 the heavy REEs uh, that are needed for making permanent magnets for various applications uh, that are different than regular magnets. Um, we know that the the first source would be getting uh, would be taking from recovery would be taken from an existing equipment. So we saw on the floor. Of, of a company in, in Boone, Iowa, we saw uh, a transmission from an electric vehicle and, and where they were, they were asked to take out the actual magnets. Uh, and that took so long, it's not economically feasible to extract existing manufacturing magnets and then put them in a new, in, in, a, in, a, new, in a new component. Then we realized that there's swarf when, they, when, they, uh, when they're making magnets and cutting them to precise sizes to make, put them in rotors and motors that the little extra that, that the filings that come off, that is that is the second most productive source because it's pure, it's raw. And, th and then the next way would be getting it from, from leaching it out, rare earth element materials uh, out of existing things li like, uh, like um, hard drives and, and things like that, cell phones, hard drives. Um, so so we, we know the technical answer to that. We, all, we also know where, where, which types of rare earths are needed for which application. Uh, and then we balance that with, with market and where the market's going and commodity rates and figure out what's the best solution, the best sourcing, the best techniques, and to package them all up. So maybe it's a com combination of having all of those three techniques uh, to commercialize at the same time. So, so it's, it's a pretty... Um, I see the question now. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're working on, on the mediums and heavy REs at this point. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, so I believe uh, those are all the uh, questions here.
Uh, I want to so thank you. I'm sorry, Mark. Uh, I want to thank you again for a great presentation between uh, the both of you and uh, again for uh, Darish being on hold to answer questions as well. Uh, we This was uh, very timely for your audience here, which is Critical Materials Institute, and we're glad to have you as affiliates. This recording is going to be available next week at aimslab.gov slash CMI on YouTube on the Critical Materials Institute channel. Um, as always, the next webinar is going to be announced in the Critical Times newsletter, uh, uh, the website above, and on Ames National Lab social media. We're always, again, looking for suggestions, so please don't hesitate to give us additional suggestions uh, to bring on uh, our affiliates and our team members just like these today, which add such great value. Again, I want to thank this team. I want to thank everybody for, for joining us, and I want to thank this team again for bringing great resources to us. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing everybody next month.